In 82 AD, the emperor Domitian constructed an arch in Rome, the Arch of Titus, to commemorate his brother's military accomplishments, most notably the siege of Jerusalem 12 years earlier in 70 AD. The Roman army marched into Jerusalem. They destroyed the Jewish temple stone by stone. They plundered the treasures of the Jewish temple. In fact, on one of the panels and one of the reliefs on the arch, we can see one of the most vivid depictions of the artifacts of the Jewish temple. As you see the Roman soldiers carrying the menorah out of the most sacred place of the Jewish people. That arch captured a moment. The apparent triumph of Rome over the God of Israel. The power of Rome had overthrown the power of the God of Israel. The glory of Rome had replaced the glory of the God of Israel. The presence of Rome had supplanted the presence of the God of Israel. Or so it seemed. In reality, the presence of God had poured out of the temple decades earlier and was taking up new residence. At the time that the temple is being constructed, there is a new movement of God that is already underway. God is building a house for himself in small bands of people across the Roman Empire. Jews and Gentiles, soldiers and slaves, merchants, men and women who are devoting their lives to the teachings of a Jewish rabbi. Patterning their lives after a Jewish rabbi by the name of Jesus. The power of God, the glory of God, the presence of God was finding place in the way of Jesus. And 300 years later, this fledgling group, this fringe religion would become the religion of the empire. Now, if you're Emperor Domitian in 82 AD and you're building this arch that declares the supremacy of Rome, that declares the power of Rome overthrowing the power of the Jewish people, the God of Israel, if someone had told you that 300 years later the tables would have been entirely turned, you would have thought they were crazy. The idea... The idea that the God that the empire had sought to extinguish would become the God that the empire would embrace would have been unfathomable, illogical, impossible, incomprehensible, and yet that's exactly what happened. Within 300 years of the building of this arch, the the pagan gods of Rome would be replaced with the God of Israel. The images of the Roman Caesars would be replaced by images of Jesus of Nazareth. Today in the Colosseum in Rome, you can go into the box of the emperors where they would sit and watch the entertainment and watch the gladiatorial games. And in the box of the emperor stands a cross. The way of humility and suffering of Jesus stands in stark contrast to the way of ego and power of the empire. How did that happen? We see whispers of it on the earliest pages of scripture. In Genesis 12, when God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you great and I'm going to make you a great nation and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And the patriarchs and the poets and the prophets longed for the fulfillment of that promise. And then the prophet Daniel would declare the coming of the Son of Man, the one who would usher in a new kingdom. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he becomes the focal point for the hopes of Jewish redemption. And when Jesus goes to launch His revolution, he does it with this command. In Matthew, then Jesus came to them and said, 
all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Now, the the disciples, these guys who were the closest friends of Jesus, who had heard his teachings and seen his miracles, who had been a part of observing his death and his resurrection, anticipated and assumed his next move when he told them to go and wait in Jerusalem. In Acts 1, 6, they say, uh, then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the moment? Is this the day when everything changes? Where do we start? What's next? Do we go and, and address the corruption of the religious aristocracy and the temple? Or do we go to Rome and address and confront the powers of the empire. What do we do next? What is the next move? What is the next step? And Jesus responds in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, go change the world. Take my message everywhere. Make sure that people that live on the other side of the globe and speak different languages and have different customs and different priorities know about me. Change the world the way I changed your life. Now that's an impossible task for a group of 120 Jewish people living under Roman occupation in first century Palestine. In a day when people rarely traveled 30 miles outside their own home. There were no cars. There was no printing press. There was no social media. Go change the world. I mean, what would we do? We would would organize a rally. We would hold a press conference. We would launch a mass marketing campaign. Get known. Get seen. Get heard. Get people talking. Get attention. But that wasn't the way they did it. I think to understand the way that the Jesus way made its way across the entire Roman Empire, we've got to better understand the ways of Jesus. To reverse engineer how the followers of Jesus rewrote history, we have to dive in a little bit to the culture and the history of first century Judaism. Because Jesus' strategy for unleashing his kingdom was rooted in first century Jewish rabbinic systems of study. At the age of five uh, five years, Jewish boys and some girls would go to Beit Sefer and they would learn reading and writing by using the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. They would commit the entire Torah to memory. Those that did well, about 10% of that group would go on to Beit Talmud and they would would graduate on and they would continue their studies by memorizing the rest of the Old Testament, the writings and the prophets. And then at 13 years of age, most Jewish boys would enter into an apprenticeship, into learning the trade, entering into the work, typically the work of their father. The best and the brightest, a fraction of a percent could apply to the next stage of study. They could apply to follow a rabbi. This small percent of those that were selected would then become a student, a learner, a disciple called a Talmudim. And the Talmudim would commit, would devote themselves to doing four things. The disciple would commit to memorizing the words of their rabbi, adopting the worldview of their rabbi, imitating the practices of their rabbi, 
and committing to make disciples of their own in the way of their rabbi. So when Jesus calls these 12 guys to follow him, to be with him, he's calling them to do these four things. To memorize his words, to adopt his worldview, to imitate his practices, and to make disciples of their own. Now, Matthew and John memorized his words to the point where they were able to recite them in their Gospels of Matthew and John. The disciples followed the ways of Jesus, the way he related to his father, the way that he related to others, the way that he practiced his faith. And then Jesus sent them out to represent him, to teach, to heal, to save, to deliver. And after his resurrection, Jesus tells them, go make disciples of all nations. Go wait for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. You'll have the power to do that. And on the day of Pentecost, Peter, one of the disciples, stands up and he preaches the words of Jesus. And 3,000 people are added to the church. The the church begins to practice the ways of Jesus and people are saved and they're healed and they're delivered and they're encouraged and they're cared for. They partner in the mission of Jesus and despite persecution, the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved and they began to get the attention of the Roman Empire. Paul would tell people, imitate me as I imitate Christ, following in the footsteps of his rabbi, Jesus. And Paul would say to his young disciple, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.2, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will, be, who, um, who will also be qualified to teach others. As Paul And the disciples and others followed Jesus' model of investing in a few. The message of Jesus began to spread. It began to go into new places from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. The early church stood in stark contrast to the power of empire. The early church garnered the attention of the ancient world by the way that they cared for the sick and the marginalized and against all odds. The church spread across the Roman Empire. And 2,000 years later, Jesus is still building his church. Through a group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit, learning to live their lives from Jesus and inviting others to do the same. People who are committed to being students of the words of Jesus, imitators of the ways of Jesus, and partners in the mission of Jesus. Go make disciples. It's the last command that we find in the book of Matthew, and if we are not careful, we will allow it to become our least concern. Go make disciples of all nations, and yet it was Jesus' plan for building his church. And if we're not careful, we will let it be reduced to just one of many plans that are a part of our church experience. Go make disciples. It's what Jesus gave all of his life to. And if we're not careful, we will relegate it to a morning quiet time or a devotional workbook and check off the list that we've done the work of discipleship and Jesus says this is about your whole life go make disciples being a disciple of Jesus means that we are students of his words imitators of his ways and partners in his mission let's just take a moment and unpack those three ideas one the words of Jesus now when I talk about the words of Jesus certainly that's the red letters In the gospel, but it's more than that. It's the entirety of scripture. Jesus had the entire Old Testament 
memorized. He rooted his ministry and his teaching in the context of the Old Testament. Now, look, it's easy for us to just play the divinity card here. But I personally don't think that Jesus' mind, human mind, came preloaded with the content. I think Jesus did what every other Jewish boy did and memorized his text. And the brilliance of Jesus to quote the text, to refer to the text, to make connections between that passage and that passage, to give deeper meaning to that passage, was and is un paralleled. Jesus was brilliant with the words of scripture. Jesus was the fulfillment of scripture. He says, I have come to fulfill the law. That doesn't mean to check a box and say it's over and done and now I've got a new plan. It means that he has come in his life to show the proper interpretation and application of the scripture. He's the fulfillment of scripture and he is the embodiment of scripture. John begins his gospel by saying that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus embodies the entirety of scripture. And so being a student of the words of Jesus, it means we read scripture to get a sense of scope and story. We study the scripture Immersing ourselves in the world of Jesus to better understand the words of Jesus by looking through geographical and cultural and historical and spiritual lenses. It means that we meditate on the words of Jesus to internalize it so that the Holy Spirit can bring it to memory at the appropriate time and we can draw on it for guidance and for wisdom. It means that we memor I'm sorry, meditating. I mixed up my definitions meditating <laughs> so that we can in, um, we can it we can immerse ourselves in the text so that it ignites our imagination it engages our will it transforms our hearts and then memorizing so we internalize it the holy spirit can call it to memory at the appropriate times we can draw on it for guidance and for wisdom students of the words of jesus and then imitators of the ways of Jesus. The ways of Jesus is simply what Jesus did, the way that he did it. You know, when, when the almighty, most holy creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the universe says, follow me, we should know intuitively that that means something different, more important, more significant, more profound than following him on Instagram. It's not about following our favorite sports team. Do, do we follow Jesus like we're following a social media account or like our lives depend on it? And guys, look, if we're honest, sometimes we are more faithful to following social media accounts and our favorite sports teams than we are to following Jesus. Jesus has not called us to be a fan. And sometimes we think we're following Jesus when actually we've just asked Jesus to follow us. Jesus did not ask us to simply be in philosophical agreement with his teachings. He's asked us to follow him, doing what he did, the way that he did it. Earl Krepp said this, Jesus is not a food additive. He did not come to improve your life. He came to be your life. You see, here's what we do sometimes. We have Jesus in our church box right here. And we line that up next to our relationships box, our vocational box, our recreational box. Jesus doesn't want to be in that box over there. He wants you to let him out and get in every other box in your life. Jesus does not want to be the top of your list of priorities. He wants to be central to every priority that you have in your life. 
Jesus wants us to be with him in a way that the Holy Spirit can shape us and form us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, um, relationally, vocationally, so that we can bear the fruit of the Spirit individually and be formed into the beloved community corporately. Walking in the ways of Jesus, sharing the road with Jesus, imitating his practices, the way he prayed, the way he fasted, the way he forgave, the way he walked in humility, the way that he encouraged and the way he confronted, the way that he loved, the way that he was a grace giver and a tone setter and a peacemaker and a status quo disruptor, walking in the ways of of Jesus. Finally, he calls us to be on mission. Student of the words, imitator of the ways, and partner in the mission of Jesus. The mission is what he came to do. The unleashing of his kingdom. The bringing of heaven to earth. That the Father's will would be done and his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Again, we, we see Jesus' mission finding its initial promise in Genesis 12. Through you, you, I will bless all the nations of the world. Jesus stands up in a synagogue in Nazareth and reads from the Isaiah scroll and declares His mission in Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I'm going to read it again. Let these words sink deep into your gut. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he sat down and said, today, This scripture has been fulfilled in your eyes. The mission of Jesus to bring restoration and renewal and reconciliation and redemption to all of creation. Jesus doesn't just save us from something. He calls us to something. He says, come play a role in the story that I am writing in your generation to restore shalom, the harmony of all things, harmony with God, harmony with creation, harmony with one another. And when we walk in the ways of of Jesus, partners in the mission of Jesus, we see the flourishing of communities and the the impact ripples across generations. Partners in the mission of Jesus. This week we start a new series called Disciple. And this week is just part one of talking about what it means to learn to live our lives from Jesus. Next week, you'll hear from a number of our pastors as they unpack what it means to do this, the things that anchor us in this process, the idea that discipleship is fueled by the Holy Spirit. Discipleship is rooted and relationship. Discipleship is matured through a process. Discipleship is marked by integration, and discipleship is measured by multiplication. Together, we're going to learn how to live our lives from Jesus. On the NCC Daily, we'll be sharing stories of real-life discipleship, people being disciples and making disciples in their everyday walking around lives. If you're not following the NCC Daily, I would encourage you right now, get the app, Subscribe to the podcast, and together, let's learn what it means to live our lives based 
on the words, the ways, and the mission of Jesus. One feature of the Jesus disciple story that I particularly love. When Jesus called those 12 guys to follow him, he he went after the guys that didn't make the cut. Like, these guys were already back to work. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were out just in normal life, doing normal jobs, doing normal things, which means they did not graduate beyond Beit Talmud. They had not been selected by a rabbi to become a disciple, and yet Jesus goes to them and says, follow me. Whoever you are, wherever you are, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. During this series, we're going to consistently offer two invitations. One, we want to invite you to be a disciple. Will you commit to learning to live your life from Jesus, being a student of his words, an imitator of his ways, and a partner in his mission? And secondly, we want to invite you to become a disciple maker where you invite others into your life as you live it so that they also can learn to live their lives from Jesus. And right now, this weekend, I just want to offer an invitation to you. If you want to take your first step in following Jesus, now is your moment. Look, maybe you've been in the church for a long time, but if you're honest, you've just been a fan of Jesus. You've just been following Jesus like you follow social media, or you think you've been following Jesus, but really, you just ask Jesus to follow you. Now is your moment to take a new step to saying, I will devote the entirety of my life to Jesus. I will bend my knee to the rule and the reign of Jesus in my life, and I will follow him. Maybe you are new to the church. You're new to Christianity. You're new to faith. You're new to this whole thing. Jesus says to you today, follow me. Maybe you're coming back to church. Maybe you left for some reason, at some point, and maybe it had nothing to do with Jesus at all. But Jesus is telling you today, follow me. And you say, well, I've just got a lot of questions. I'm not sure. Jesus says, just follow me. You might say, I'm not sure which way to go, what I'm supposed to do. Jesus says, it's okay. Just follow me. If not now, when? If not here, where? If you're watching us online, you can hit that raise hand button right now. You can go to ncc.re slash follow Jesus. If you're here in the house with us today, you can go to ncc.re slash follow Jesus or grab the QR code that you see on the screen or on your armrest. Jesus says, follow me. And if today you want to take that first step for the first time, would you just pray with me right now? Jesus, I'm ready to stop going my own way and ready to come home. I'm ready to stop walking my own path and I'm ready to share the road with you, to walk in your footsteps and in your ways. I'm ready to lay down the rights to my own life and submit to your rule and reign. I'm ready to allow your words to give shape to how I view the world. I'm ready to do what you did the way that you did it. Thank you for the cross. I give you all of my life, all of my sin, and receive from you all of your righteousness. Thank you for the resurrection. I give you my life and step into your new life today. Thank you for saving me. Let's do this. In Jesus' name, amen.